สวัสดีค่ะ Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of our Aquaculture Webinar Week organized by Informa Markets. My name is June c h u t i m a t a t o n g and I will be the moderator for today. Today we will have three sessions with uh, many guest speakers, so please stay tuned with us. For the first session of today, we'll be presenting by Infofish, Mr. s u j i t Krishna Das, on the topic technological innovations and development in aquaculture. We will also have Ms. s h e r l e e n Maria, and Tony Sami presenting on the topic i n f o f i s h and updates on impact of COVID-19 on markets and trade. But before I'm giving the stage to Mr. Das, I will introduce him a bit. Mr. Das is a highly motivated aquaculture professional, having more than 10 years of solid experience in fishery and aquaculture sector. He has hands-on experience in developing and adding value to the aquaculture value chains, including shrimp breeding, intensive nursing and farming protocol, feed formulations and development, aquatic animal health management, and biosecurity issue to ensure a transable, resilient, and technological uh, oriented sustainable aquaculture. He has also aquaculture working experience in Malaysia, Bangladesh, and other Southeast Asian country. Mr. Das holds a bachelor honor marine science degree and master degree in aquaculture from the Institute of Marine Science and Fishery, University of Chittagong, Bangladesh. At present, he is responsible for providing technical advisory and consultancy service. To the InfoFish member state, and keeping a b r a n c h of the new technological development within the fishery and aquaculture industry, as a technical officer at InfoFish Malaysia. So now, please welcome Mr. Das. Hello, good morning, Mr. Ms. Jun. Uh, thank you for inviting this uh, aquaculture webinar week. And now, just I'm uh, sharing my screen. Uh, Miss Jude, can you see my screen, please? Yes. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, Welcome again. Uh, my name is Sujit Krishna Das, and I'm a technical officer at InfoFish, and uh, I will uh, take you to the uh, technical journey uh, uh, regarding the technical innovations and the tech, uh, and, and developments in aquaculture. So let's go with me. So what we'll be uh, I'm discussing today: uh, status of aquaculture development and uh, a brief history of aquaculture innovation, and uh, Innovation and technological trends and take-home messages. Uh, let's go with some um, infographics uh, from the United Nations f o uh, flagship publication, Sophia 2020. We see that uh, from this um, uh, graph, uh, the aquaculture production by 2018 uh, was a, was an. World record in, in 2018, and it was uh, 179 million metric ton, uh, of which uh, 82.1 million metric ton comes from the aquaculture. So uh, we can we can we can say that the uh, the aquaculture industry is now quite big uh, that we thought earlier. So um, what will be the uh, production forecast uh, by uh, uh, by 2030? Uh, we see that the uh, Production will be around uh, will be around uh, 200 million metric ton by uh, by 2030. So it, 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 we, we can say that, uh, that it is growing very fast, and it will uh, will it will have to grow because uh, the population is growing. So we need to grow more uh, more food uh, for the um, uh, increased number of population. Uh, what you see from this Venn diagram, we see that by uh, by 2030, the aquaculture uh, the contribution from aquaculture will be around 53 percent, whereas the um, in the, the uh, 
capture fisheries will contribute about 43 percent and um, we also see that the global food fish uh, consumption from aquaculture will be around 60 percent uh, but uh, at the same time the uh, capture fisheries will uh, contribute around 40 percent so the role is increasing day by day and it will it, it will uh, grow uh, obviously so what are the regional contribution uh, 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 this part of this world where we live uh, always we see that the china contribution the contribution of china is always uh, highest and after that the asean region uh, uh, contributes a lot uh, so uh, it will also uh, continue uh, uh, continue contributing in the aquaculture sector i i, I hope so and what, what is the graph says? Uh, this uh, graph actually uh, comparison of the uh, 2018 to 2028 uh, global seafood production comparison, where you see that uh, in, from 20, uh, 2008 to 2018, the growth was very, um, uh, very uh, sharp. But uh, in future, by 2028, 20, uh, uh, we, uh, the, the economist, uh, Pro, uh, economists thought that the, the, uh, the production will be a bit uh, slower due to the saturation of uh, saturation of aquaculture in some countries and uh, population uh, increase. So what we see in this uh, colorful uh, colorful uh, uh, picture, we see that um, the aquaculture production systems not only diverse with the with the uh, species but also. Um, uh, diverse in case of uh, production patterns. Uh, you, you see the, here are so lots of uh, shrimps, prawns, uh, carp fishes, uh, catfishes, and uh, ornamental fishes, and the marine fish fishes, uh, marine fin fishes, and, and the production systems is also is a uh, diverse one. And uh, we have the uh, um, production of uh, production in RAS, bioflock, in we are also producing in the offshore, uh, offshore uh, facilities, uh, uh, as well as the land based one. And we are also uh, we are also producing the seaweeds, the mollusks, uh, oyster mussels, shark shells, etc. So, um, uh, and by, uh, in a recent uh, in a recent um, uh, statistics from FAO, we see that uh, by uh, 1950 to 2017, um, uh, uh, 608 uh, species have been found uh, so far, uh, which is actually. Um, uh, among them, uh, 424 species have uh, been cultured in, in 27, whereas uh, it was uh, 254 in 1990. So uh, from this, we can we can say that uh, the uh, diversified uh, aquaculture uh, will continue uh, will continue provide uh, the uh, food for the uh, growing number of population in future. So let's uh, uh, look back uh, for some uh, challenges. Uh, what challenges we faced? In, we are facing in the traditional farming, and how we can move forward uh, by a, a smart farming to a digital uh, move. We we know that the we have uh, slow growth and uh, the uh, the uh, aquatic organisms are very prone to disease in case in, in case of traditional farming. Whereas in, in smart farming, um, uh, the, it, with the help of uh, genetic uh, improvement, uh, we can we already develop faster growth and disease resistant traits. So, um, uh, and, and in case of uh, productivity uh, and uh, labor intensivity, traditional farming uh, always, uh, always lagging behind. Whereas uh, in um, uh, smart farming, uh, they are always going with the technology oriented um, uh, production system. And we also uh, we also seen that uh, poor feed management and less consideration of aquatic animal health in the in case of traditional farming. Uh, whereas by this time we have already seen that the automatic feeder uh, came out and um, uh, consideration of aquatic animal health management is uh, considered in smart farming very well. And uh, I can mention here that uh, in case of traditional farming, um, uh, they always follow the uh, follow the horizontal expansion method. Which um, which require more space, uh, uh, which uh, which uh, uh, require more space, water, and uh, uh, wastage. And in case of uh, in case of uh, in case of uh, um, smart farming, we see that uh, they apply the vertical integration method, where they can reuse the water and uh, other resources with the limited wastage. 
And um, in case of traditional farming, we see that the uh, utilization of trophic level and uh, output not up to the mark. Uh, in case of smart farming, yes, we can utilize the uh, maximum output and we can utilize the, uh, all the uh, multi-trophic levels. And um, um, production and marketing channel uh, in, is traditional, as you know, in, in traditional farming. But uh, in smart farming, uh, it should be uh, uh, it should go with the diverse species, and then they they mo mostly focus on the consumer centric. And uh, transparency and certification uh, issues uh, are lower in traditional farming, uh, and obviously in smart farming, transparency and certification uh, rate are higher. Uh, and in case of traditional, uh, in case of packaging system, uh, obviously the uh, the traditional uh, farming system use the traditional packaging system and in case of farming system they try to use the biodegradable materials like uh, and the ocean source materials like algae based materials or the 100 percent organic or biodegradable materials uh, are being used as a uh, uh, packaging material so that uh, it cannot uh, create any environmental uh, additional environmental impact and um, higher environmental impact uh, uh, comes from the traditional farming and uh, in case of uh, smart farming, obviously uh, it is efficient, so less environmental impact. And uh, traditional farms sometimes do not consider about the women empowerment and the uh, welfare of uh, uh, fish welfare, uh, sometimes not considered. But in case of smart farming, uh, the new entrepreneurs now, the uh, young entrepreneurs are always uh, welcome uh, the women empowerment and the Women empowerment means the women participation, and uh, here women participation in every step of uh, seafood value chain and fish welfare is considered in the in case of smart farming. So uh, we have we have to we have to have uh, move forward towards smart farming, uh, considering all these challenges. So what other risk factors in aquatic animal farming? Uh, we see uh, we have uh, the aquaculture industry is the, has tremendous land use conflict with the other uh, protein production uh, uh, production systems like uh, livestock, like the tourism industry, like the energy sector, coastal energy sector. So uh, they may always have some uh, conflict with the land use, uh, uh, land use and uh, and have some issues with the, of the pollution, fish meal, fish oil, and the antimicrobial residual issues. Obviously, and the climate change is uh, is uh, one of the most uh, triggering factor in future. Uh, the triggering factor or triggering risk, which uh, which is very alarming for our aquaculture industry. And some of the internal and external risks, I can say here that uh, the disease. Poor quality, uh, poor genetic quality, poor feed and seed quality, and the raw material uh, and inconsistent raw material supply. These are the internal risks and external risks like market uncertainty, compliance, and uh, uh, and and also the consumer expectation. So we can say that uh, the these uh, internal and external risks also uh, hampering uh, our production system very uh, very much. So, but. Uh, by this time, uh, in COVID, we know the COVID-19 uh, has an unprecedented impact on our aquaculture industry. I will not focus on the impact of the uh, uh, COVID-19 today. Uh, my colleague will uh, later in my, uh, after my presentation will focus on the impact of COVID. But uh, the one positive thing I, I, can, I can tell here that COVID enables us to think about uh, differently, innovatively in case of uh, seafood value chain. We see uh, during the COVID times, uh, many innovations uh, uh, already been seen in, the, in every step of seafood value chain. And the industry need to work, uh, I think, need to work hand in hand, taking into consideration of the technological innovations and the multi-stakeholder approach to ensure sustainable intensification. Obviously, uh, not excluding the small scale holders. We have to consider the small scale holders because most of the uh, ASEAN countries uh, has uh, a big uh, uh, portion uh, covers the small scale holders. And how this uh, sustainable intensification can be achieved? Uh, obviously, the, with the help of technological innovations. And uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I, I shown here already some uh, uh, steps here 
yes, we have to follow the diversified species. Uh, we cannot depend on a single species or one or two species. We have to we have to consider about the molas. We have to uh, um, we have to consider about the seaweeds. And innovative technology uh, to increase the production is a, is a prime and uh, for, uh, foremost important step in case of aquaculture. It should be, and because of and in case of every uh, every production stages uh, in, from the farm to the fork, uh, we need in innovation and diversified market. Uh, COVID has uh, shown us that the dependency on the international market, how it impacts uh, severely. So we need to focus on the domestic market also. And uh, what uh, what will be the traceability and the compliance? Yes, uh, we, we know that uh, for international markets, different markets needs different compliance. So we need to we need to ensure uh, um, uh, compliance for both for domestic and both for, uh, for the international market as well. And in case of the last but not the least, uh, environmental and social consideration. In case of environmental and social consideration, I can say that um, the um, uh, reuse and recycle of the uh, materials, uh, as I mentioned, for the packaging materials, and also the participation of women, uh, women and uh, and engaging more women in case of every value chain. Yes, it is. It is true that in in many Asian uh, ASEAN countries, including Vietnam, Thailand, um, and Bangladesh, has a huge number of uh, women participant in the processing uh, sector. But yet, to uh, they are not in the in the. Uh, in the stage of uh, selling selling position, so they need uh, we need more participation of the um, so the, the environmental and social condition will be will be uh, maintained uh, very perfectly and uh, the uh, intensification will be sus sustainable. And why innovation is needed? We we, we need to uh, we need to know it very clearly. Um, um, uh, in, a, in a recent uh, article by Edwards and, and Geoffrey Ackle, uh, we, we see that innovation is essential to resolve the existing production risk and, and transform the sector towards the sustainable intensification. So uh, we have to mitigate the existing uh, uh, risk and we have to uh, move, forward, uh, uh, move forward the sector towards the sustainable in in intensification. So uh, in, in, there is no way without the innovative uh, solutions, we have to come up with the innovative solutions and innovations um, uh, can be of two types. It may be of the problem oriented, it may be of the demand oriented. Problem oriented, I mean, the, it may be uh, to, uh, to, to uh, solve the, any disease problem and uh, to, uh, to develop the faster uh, trade for the, uh, for the uh, farmers and uh, demand oriented I, I want to mean here the traceability and the uh, development of value-added products okay so uh, now I'm going to uh, uh, share you a brief history of aquaculture innovations actually this is the uh, compilation of a recently published uh, uh, report by Hakai magazine UK uh, I will, uh, I'm, I'm discussing here. This is uh, this is perfectly uh, practical uh, in in this part of uh, part of the world uh, as well, because uh, here uh, they compiled many technological developments uh, uh, which happened in the, uh, in the earlier um, uh, two two, uh, two centuries as well. We see that uh, we, as as we know in China, um, uh, 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 farming of common crops started uh, 3,500 BC. But uh, in, in case of uh, in case of uh, uh, European context, we see that the international fisheries exhibition started uh, in UK in 1833 uh, with the growing interest of uh, uh, culturing salmon, uh, salmon, uh, trout, and oysters. Uh, uh, and um, we also see that in 1899, establishment of marine uh, laboratories and fish hatcheries uh, in, in Europe. And in 1924, we see that the tilapia, the aquatic chicken, we call it, uh, it started in Kenya. And by uh, 1970, uh, the sex reversal technology and the tilapia production uh, through hormone, uh, hormone manipulation achieved. And is, uh, it is now being cultured in 127 uh, countries by 2017. So it is a huge, um, huge, uh, uh, implication the tilapia has a huge implication in the aquaculture sector and is one of the uh, vital source of protein for the uh, pro poor or the poor uh, people and in 1927 we see that uh, vertical floating raft culture uh, developed by Jap 
by Japanese uh, uh, scientists for oysters and uh, in uh, brine shrimp artemia as a, a source of uh, food for fish larvae uh, uh, discovered in USA in 1933. In 1950, we see that the revolutionary use of plastics uh, started uh, immediately after the uh, couple of years of uh, Second World War. And in 1954, we see that the development of feed in a moist and soft fillet by the Oregon Fish Commission in USA. And in 1958, we see that uh, one Japanese scientist, uh, Mr. Motosako uh, uh, Moto Fujinaga, uh, developed the artific artificial spawning and hatching of uh, Kuru mushroom. And in 1959, uh, uh, floating wooden case with the suspended net for uh, Atlantic salmon uh, culture started. So uh, um, having said that, I, I can also mention here that the artificial propagation and the spawning of uh, bivalves by Victor Luz uh, Luzanov and his colleagues in, uh, in the Milford Laboratory, NOAA, USA. And in uh, 1970, we see that the first commercial salmon production farm started by Karsten Brothers in Norway. In 1971, we see that first family-based breeding program of salmon started in, in uh, Norway as well. And uh, one back breakthrough technology come up in 1980, what we call the RAS technology or the green technology in Denmark, uh, initiated in Denmark with a view to culture of the European eel. Um, in 1999, we see that the acoustic technology uh, uh, to monitor fish swimming behavior. In fact, it was the beginning of a computer uh, vision technology by using the underwater camera and algorithm to monitor the fish, uh, uh, fish and the uh, fish lice infestation. And in 2017, we see that the world first offshore farm developed in uh, developed by Salma in Norway, and 2018 first uh, deep sea farm developed in Chile. And uh, in, by 2020, we see that the Jarmac uh, uh, introduced iFarm project, which can monitor not only the case, but also the individual fish. So these are the uh, summary of uh, some uh, interesting and the important uh, developments in aquaculture innovations. And, um, uh, but uh, I, I have found, I have gone through some uh, literature at the recently published article in a uh, aquaculture journal uh, where Bush et al. Uh, showed that USD um, translated the technology and innovation platform from Europe to Asia. And uh, under this project, they started a national three national pilot projects in, in Bangladesh, Thailand, and Vietnam. And they found that these uh, uh, technological innovation are non-linear and pluriform. So uh, besides that, uh, some other um, uh, seafood accelerators and the investment firms are also working uh, to uh, uh, to develop this aquaculture sector like uh, Aquaspark, Hatch, and Global Aquaculture Innovation Award. They are also trying to uh, create more innovation platforms, and, and they are trying to engage more uh, technologies uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the industry as well. Uh, now I will focus uh, on the um, innovations and the technological trends. Uh, mostly, I will uh, I will discuss on the uh, seven. Uh, uh, under the seven topic, uh, mostly on the land-based, uh, sea-based uh, sea uh, farming and the precision farming, smart genetics and uh, biosecurity and health management and the alternative protein development and smart business uh, operation and management. So let's see what um, what we uh, what we have in the uh, land-based production system. We see the aquaponics. Uh, aquaponics uh, is uh, already in, in during this COVID time. Uh, aquaponics uh, played a very good vital role in producing uh, uh, fish and vegetable at the same time because uh, it, it, in the, this system can be used as a small scale and larger scale. That is the small scale and the commercial for both. Uh, one of our member country, uh, Philippines, is doing uh, uh, doing well by using this uh, aquaponics system. And this is not a new technology. It is also invented in early 70s. IPRS, this is an, another uh, important technology um, which has been uh, developed by, uh, by a scientist from Auburn University, Dr. Chappell, and some farmers, uh, some farmers there, which uses the raceway in the pond to, to produce fish uh, more efficiently uh, and to, uh, to achieve uh, the better yield. And the um, next one is the RAS, and this is I, I call this is a uh, clean technology, and uh, this is more um, mostly uh, uh, 
they uh, they ensure the water uh, and the and the energy uh, and the feed uh, used very uh, efficiently and uh, the and next uh, technology bioflock technology um, uh, these uh, these uh, figure we see recently we visited one uh, by uh, bioflock farm in malaysia uh, so they are uh, uh, and these technology actually uh, enhances the water quality by um, by uh, balancing the carbon and uh, the nitrogen so um, and with a view to uh, with a view to uh, control the water quality and uh, reduce the fca and the compete with the pathogens as well uh, because uh, these uh, bioflocks are being uh, uh, naturally grown and uh, and it is uh, considered as one of the one of the revolutionary technology in our time and, and uh, the last uh, land based technology i can i can i can tell you about the uh, uh, integrated aquaculture and uh, agriculture and aquaculture technology. This is not a new technology. This is a century old technology and has been practiced in China, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Bangladesh and Laos for many, uh, many years. And um, uh, the, why I'm saying it, this is very sustainable technology because from this uh, same production unit, a farmer can produce the rice and he can produce the fish and on the dike, he can produce the vegetable as well. So within a production system, he can, uh, he can ensure his protein, carbohydrate and uh, uh, other uh, nutrients as well. So uh, now I'm going to uh, next sea-based uh, uh, production systems. I, I, can, uh, I can tell here that in, in, uh, in uh, many of our ASEAN countries, uh, they follow the coastal case culture, offshore uh, case culture, and the deep sea, uh, uh, deep sea farming, yet not uh, very popular in our in this part of this world, but uh, is already established in Europe and in some uh, North Am uh, American uh, countries, South American countries like Chile, and uh, in some European countries, they also um, uh, started these bars like um, uh, offshore farming. Uh, we call it Ocean Farm One. And I can tell you the most effective uh, uh, sea-based farming uh, is integrated, um, uh, integrated multi-tropic aquaculture because uh, in, in this production system, uh, a farmer can use, uh, use the water resources, the ocean, ocean resources very well uh, because uh, they can use the fin fish uh, and the other extractive species like the molar seaweeds. Uh, and abalone uh, sea, sea anemone uh, so that uh, the the and, uh, sea environment uh, cannot be uh, polluted and ca can be used perfectly and um, uh, having said that uh, i can tell that uh, already uh, we have seen that many uh, developments in uh, in case of remotely operated vehicles and uh, aqua in, in aquaculture drones are being used and uh, robots are being used to clean the uh, hatchery tanks and now I'm going to show you one uh, video where uh, the, uh, uh, the remotely operated vehicles are using as uh, to uh, clean the net.
So uh, we see that how uh, the uh, applying a net cleaner are being used as uh, to clean the uh, offshore nets. And um, uh, the most uh, interesting and the prominent uh, uh, development I so far I have seen in the precision farming. Uh, why uh, in this uh, in this uh, uh, precision farming, Internet of Things sensors, auto feeder are being used, or the artificial intelligence are being used to to monitor the water quality parameters, to control the feeding, and uh, to uh, control the uh, 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 to control the environmental data from the satellite satellite image and to, con uh, to uh, monitor the uh, water quality and the chlorophyll and, and to the algal bloom also. So um, we, can, uh, we can see that uh, these um, IOTs actually are nothing but a network of electronic devices and, uh, and it may be of personal gadgets or the wearable devices and home appliances and office machines or industrial equipment and that are connected to the internet. So these kind of, uh, we have seen many, many startup companies coming up from uh, Indonesia, Singapore, and, uh, and, and many parts of the uh, world as, as well. And they are, uh, they are developing many devices uh, to improve the uh, farming system, to improve the operation and monitoring and uh, remote, uh, op uh, remote operation is also uh, being uh, evolved uh, very sharply. So, uh, sorry. Uh, now I can I can focus on uh, some artificial intelligence which are being used in in case of feed management. Uh, this is a one uh, artificial uh, intelligence uh, uh, feed appetite index developed by Omitrum, and uh, so uh, by this uh, they can uh, they can control the feeding and demand feeding also be done with this. And uh, this is actually a, a shrimp PL counter. This company. Uh, uh, started uh, uh, started marketing this product in, in, in 2018, but now we see that uh, they uh, come up with a new solution. They, what they call uh, they call it as a um, uh, they call it as a growth platform by which they can uh, they can monitor the uh, disease, they can monitor the feed, they can harvest the uh, uh, they can monitor the harvest, and they can track the production record. So let's go with uh, a small video. <music> I have uh, more slides. I, I want to uh, I want to update you more technologies in the aquaculture. So uh, smart genetics, uh, yes, uh, we have seen some uh, very very good uh, achievements, very good developments in uh, in the uh, genetics uh, side. I can say that the best uh, development come up, uh, come up with the genetics, and uh, we see the uh, in, in this early uh, early January or the I cannot remember now in in the. 20, end of 2019, Roslyn Institute of uh, University of uh, Institute under the University of Ed Edinburgh, they developed uh, TILB resistant tilapia, and we have also know that the scientists from uh, World Fish Center, Philippines, and uh, Norway they developed 85 percent uh, fast growing um, in, in gift tilapia strain, and this is uh, this is the 14th generation. And uh, uh, World Fish Center already distributed this uh, this strain to uh, uh, more than 16 countries, in, including the ASEAN countries. So um, uh, we can say that these uh, developments are very, uh, in case of disease resistant, in case of uh, fast growing uh, strain development. So um, uh, tremendous uh, achievement, I think. 
and in, we know some uh, some genetic company are developing spf and spr growth uh, uh, to improve uh, improve the uh, improve the farming operation in the shrimp shrimp farming and to uh, to control the disease as, uh, as well and we see that another achievement uh, in uh, salmon farming uh, in, in in 2018 we see that eco advantage uh, salmon and eco bounty uh, these uh, two companies, uh, uh, US FDA approved uh, one uh, technology, what we call CRISPR or Cas9 technology. In, in a shorter form, we, we call it as a gene editing technology. This technology uh, already been uh, awarded Nobel Prize uh, uh, this year. So they, uh, uh, they also use this technology to develop uh, fast growing uh, salmon, uh, which, uh, which can uh, which can uh, reduce the DUC and uh, uh, already been applied in, in, in many species like uh, rainbow trout, tilapia and carp also. But uh, as far as I know, uh, these two companies are uh, using this technology only for the Atlantic salmon yet. Uh, Biosecurity and health management. Yes, we see that the vaccination, bacteriophage, quorum sensing and advanced pathogen detection and alternative, uh, alternative for uh, antibiotic development, many many developments uh, happened by uh, so far. But uh, I I can say that uh, the vaccination is challenging, and a limited number of uh, vaccine companies are present in the market, and farmers are not uh, aware and not interested because the the vaccination process in fish is very hectic. And bacteriophage therapy, uh, yes, uh, it is an alternative to antibiotic uh, for uh, controlling the bacterial diseases. And quorum sensing, it is, a, it is also a um, uh, very um, uh, breakthrough technology in aquaculture because it is a cell-to-cell -cell communication. Uh, and it is also used in, in advanced um, uh, biosecurity management and uh, uh, um, pathogen control. And I can uh, mention here one technology here, Shrimp Multipet uh, Extra, uh, uh, developed by one Australian uh, uh, startup but recently. And by this, uh, by this uh, platform, uh, shrimp farmers can detect uh, 13 pathogens at a time from a single, single sample. And uh, except this PCR, dot blood, gene, gene chip, and underwater uh, particle, uh, virtual reality, and the LAMP technology are also being used in the pathogen detection. And uh, as far as I know, some scientists are working uh, uh, working and developed already some herbal products to control the uh, WSSB uh, in China. Uh, I, I can tell you about some uh, developments in alternative uh, protein, uh, functional feed and feed additives. Uh, as far uh, by, by July 2020, we have seen that uh, 435 million US dollar has been invested in producing uh, single cell protein. I, I mean yeast, bacteria and algae. So uh, many developments are uh, coming up uh, for developing the uh, single, cell, single cell in, in aqua feed. And I can tell about the insect-based protein. I can uh, share that uh, more than 40 startups are coming up with the uh, insect-based based protein. Uh, I can mention that uh, the uh, key uh, insects are being used as the black soldier fly, mealworm or yellow mealworm, and the house cricket. I know uh, one company from uh, Malaysia that is the nutrition technologist. They are uh, doing uh, a monthly 20 metric ton of uh, insect uh, black soldier they are producing uh, 20 metric ton of black soldier fly and they have a uh, they have a uh, um, uh, plan to produce uh, 200 metric ton per month and one company from kenya they are also uh, producing house cricket for uh, as an insect based protein and uh, as we know already marine microalgae are being uh, are also been used uh, to as an alternative to fish oil, um, and Antarctic krill has also been used as alternative uh, 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 alternative uh, protein. And uh, we can uh, say that the functional feed, uh, uh, yes, functional feed is a very uh, popular concept uh, nowadays. And uh, scientists are developing uh, uh, functional feed to uh, to to uh, control specific disease and to uh, using by uh, by using different um, additives and uh, they are also uh, also using many immune stimulants to uh, boost up the to boost up the uh, immune, immune and, and 
immune of the fishes. So, um, and they use uh, the scientists are using uh, uh, mononolidosaccharide, beta glucan, or peptides, probiotic prebiotics, and the phytobiotics as well in, uh, for producing the feed additives. Uh, the most uh, 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 interesting one uh, is, uh, I can say that here, yeah, that uh, smart uh, business operation and management. Uh, by this uh, COVID time, we have seen that the, uh, many startup companies uh, are using e-commerce platform. I know one company from Indonesia, they are using uh, the uh, Aruna, they, they connect fishermen through e-commerce platform who can sell their uh, daily catch directly to the customers. And uh, um, um, several uh, mobile apps are being used to boost up uh, on online sales or also for the, um, uh, for the traceability concerns. Uh, I know Malaysian Fisheries Association, NECMAT, are using mobile apps to promote their brands and increasing in their uh, online sales. And um, evaluated, in case of evaluated products, we see that uh, many, many new developments like the vegan seafood and the cell-based uh, cell seafoods are coming up. And in case of biodegradable packaging, I, I can mention here that uh, I know uh, two companies are there uh, developing uh, biodegradable uh, packaging from algae and uh, uh, and the sugar cane as well, uh, because uh, sci uh, the uh, uh, scientists are uh, uh, thinking that uh, if they can produce uh, uh, produce reusable materials, biodegradable materials, then it, it will not harm our mother nature. Uh, uh, smart business management, I can tell about the responsible supply chain uh, management. It is an actually integrated data analysis platform that connects the dots in uh, supply chain in, uh, in three simple steps. Uh, I know one company from Thailand, they are using uh, uh, this platform and they use the uh, social environment. They, uh, they, uh, Collects and uh, collects and verify the uh, collected data through uh, monitoring, analysis, and reporting with the help of uh, with the help of uh, mobile apps. And the uh, the uh, most exciting, uh, I think, technology already been we have uh, received so far is artificial intelligence based tuna traceability. So I'll now show you one uh, small video uh, about which they are uh, they are de developing the tuna accessibility and I can, I, I'm pretty sure that this technology will come up in shrimp very soon. Tuna, one of the most precious marine resources. As the population continues to age in Tokyo, the number of artisans that examine tuna quality has dwindled to half from its prime. This valuable skill might disappear in the near future. We challenged ourselves to create something that would ensure the sustainable supply of high quality tuna. Introducing TunaScope, an AI successor to Japan's long legacy of tuna inspection. The key was in the fish's tail. In markets in Japan, only a handful of artisans had been responsible for the inspection of tuna quality. Everything you need to know about the fish is said to be contained in this vital part. But this skill takes artisans at least 10 years to attain. We have taken a vast number of photos of crosscuts of tuna tails. Intuitive knowledge, once only attained through years of experience, was recreated through deep learning. Tunascope. An AI with an accuracy rate of over 90% compared to a veteran artisan was created. We have expanded the use of this AI from Japan to the world. Japan's skillful inspection has become available everywhere. Furthermore, the project has been adopted as a promotion program supported by the government of Japan. Our goal is to collect data from tuna markets across the world using TunaScope and create a fair global standard of tuna quality. Our AI technology developed for TunaScope can be applied to various fields in the future. TunaScope, an expert eye for AI. Okay, so I'll now focus on uh, my last two technologies. I'll not take uh, uh, time more. Um, uh, 
extra fluorescence machine to prevent the food fraud. Uh, as you know, food fraud is becoming a very, uh, uh, very health concern for the consumers. So, uh, uh, how uh, and uh, which uh, technology they use? It uses actually the elemental fingerprinting of a species. So the elements of a species differ from one region to another. And this technology has been already been applied by the Australian Nuclear Science Technology uh, Organization and uh, uh, to prevent uh, food fraud. And uh, the mm, last but not the least uh, technology I can uh, tell about the blockchain. Yes, you know the blockchain is uh, is a decentralized and uh, distributed ledger of a uh, um, uh, ledger of transaction, and that is replicated on every node or um, uh, uh, or participant in the network. Why it is uh, why we, we call it decentralized? It is in the sense that there, there is no single authority and to, to control over the network and um, it is distributed because it is uh, spread out uh, across the numerous participants worldwide so uh, we can say that this uh, blockchain technology will also uh, will also uh, a breakthrough in the uh, in the monitoring and monitoring of the seafood traceability in the and improving the seafood traceability in future um uh, by saying that having said that i i have come to my end of the presentation i will i will uh, share some take home messages from uh, this presentation national and uh, regional and international cooperation needed for more technological in innovations uh, we know we have already have some uh, uh, developments but we need more uh, technological innovations uh, for further development public private and part uh, public uh, private partnerships are required for more investments in developing new technologies and more R&D are required to develop new technologies and transfer these new technologies among the stakeholders and not avoiding the small scale sector. And uh, the most important thing is that evaluation, standardization and certification of aquaculture technology, technology is also needed. And uh, governance for sustainable intensification is essential. Uh, we, we have seen that uh, as uh, the sustainable in intensification is uh, obvious. Uh, for the increased number of population, uh, increased number of population for growing more food for the increased number of population uh, in, in future. So governance is also needed for this uh, issue. Uh, so uh, choice is yours, uh, whether you want to be follower or trendsetter. These are some references. Thank you very much. And uh, questions are welcomed. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Das. Uh, it's a very interesting presentation. So just to remind all the attendees, if you have any question, please type in the Q&A box and we will go through at the end of the session. And so now for the second topic, um, we will, which will be presenting by Ms. Shirlene. So uh, Ms. Shirlene has been heading InfoFish as acting director since May 2016 and became director of InfoFish in December 2018. Her tasks include leading and overseeing the running of the organization, including managing the trade promotion division that monitors the international fishery trade. Ms. Shirin brings with her more than 19 years of experience in monitoring and reviewing the Asian Pacific fishery industry, carrying out consultancies related to international fishery trade for private company and national bodies, publishing articles related to international fishery trade and markets, conducting training and facilitation on trade promotion, marketing and database, and coordinating national and international workshops and conference. So now please welcome Ms. Shireen. Thank you very much, Ms. June. Uh, um, can you please confirm that uh, my voice is clear and loud? Because I yes. understand this. Yes. I understand there's some, some um, issue with the audio. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And uh, yeah, so um,
my screen is uh, obvious, is it? Yes. Okay. So um, thank you very much uh, uh, for to Informa for uh, having InfoFish uh, at this very interesting and um, timely uh, event. Um, I would like to, uh, I will be talking about the, um, just a minute, sorry, I'm trying to, screen. okay. Um, I will be talking about uh, the, uh, uh, what are the trends and uh, that has taken place? Uh, in, sorry, you just just give me a minute, please. I'm not able to see my full screen. Okay. Yeah, so I'll be talking about some of the impacts on the uh, COVID-19 uh, on the international seafood trade. Uh, basically, uh, we have actually seen quite a bit on uh, how it has impacted the overall trade uh, in, um, globally since uh, it started uh, appearing in, in early this year. Uh, but uh, aside from the fact that it has really uh, taken a, a strong impact on the trade itself, there are also some of the other developments that have happened as a result of this, uh, which uh, in some ways uh, we are looking at it very much positively on how it's assisting uh, the sector to develop and uh, improve. So just to give you a retrospect of what happened uh, in Asia, um, or rather how the whole scenario started, uh, from the beginning of this year, when uh, firstly China was impacted, uh, many of the uh, suppliers or exporters to the market many of the suppliers and um, uh, to the Chinese market uh, were the first to be impacted uh, when there were uh, restrictions to the borders and um, uh, they were not able to travel. And then, uh, so this eventually uh, affected those who, the, the primarily those who were single handedly targeting the Chinese market. Eventually all the other countries uh, started uh, being affected. It was a, like a domino effect when all other countries got, uh, started getting affected and closing borders and um, sort of brought a chaos to the trade uh, and trade and markets of uh, fish and seafood. Uh, that's when we saw disruptions to the uh, distribution channels, supply chains, uh, value chain as well. And uh, that created a sort of imbalance and we were having uh, su supplies, good supplies in some markets, uh, producing places and, and uh, markets were not being able to uh, obtain that produce. Um, again, because there was no access to retail markets or wet markets, consumers eventually were not getting access to this produce. And um, although demand remains strong uh, in Asia, particularly, we were also seeing uh, uh, the retail or the catering trade being affected tremendously because of the, the shutdown uh, or rather the lockdown in many of the countries. Um, this also included uh, demand for um, high value seafood products and eventually that brought about uh, uh, declines in seafood prices. So as I mentioned just now, consumers direct channels for seafood uh, dropped during this uh, period, the, the, particularly in the first quarter of this year when the pandemic just hit and we were stuck with uh, uh, not having access to food. So. However, uh, subsequently producers, uh, distributors, uh, fishermen, even fishermen were looking all kinds of ways to uh, reach their consumers uh, with the products because demand remains strong, particularly in Asia. When we look at uh, the Asia Pacific region, we are among uh, the region with the highest per capita fish consumption. And also we also pay very much among the highest for seafood in the world. So uh, demand remains very strong in this region and uh, consumers are looking for for the seafood and fishery products. So uh, wholesalers, processors were, were trying their best to uh, reach them. And uh, one of the ways was, uh, that's when we saw the increasing use of online platforms uh, for selling the seafood. 
uh, besides uh, using delivery options to uh, a, a sort of complement uh, this online platform uh, trading. Uh, so we saw a lot of uh, uh, more and more uh, apps like GrabFood, Shopee, um, Lazada, even Alibaba, and all those other um, apps um, in the region, as you can see, uh, Food Panda, uh, Swiggy, uh, Lineman in the other, other countries within the region who were very much uh, using, being used to um, sort of bridge the gap between the producer and the consumer. Uh, we also had supermarkets who were creating online platforms to have, uh, besides grocery fishery products um, being sold uh, or delivered through these uh, apps. In addition, there was also a development in online marketplace, which was becoming stronger where you had uh, traders from wet markets who were using Facebook or uh, WhatsApp channels to promote their products. And here I'll just quickly show a video of you never request uh, we will send it as full like this. Okay, unless you feed up those that never try before our system. Okay, after life, uh, please, because you don't get fun. Everybody must proceed to the messenger, your Facebook messenger. Click on the link, it will lead you to this page. Okay, address everything how uh, we will go by whatever that you're kid up. So in the key from people, okay, I'm saying kg at ten dollars. This one very, very limited. So yeah, that was just a quick uh, uh, example of what uh, an example of how trading was done online, or rather uh, uh, through these uh, wet uh, wet market uh, traders uh, selling their seafood, uh, and there's a limited uh, time only offer, and and it sort of facilitates uh, the movement of products from uh, from the producer to the consumer. And then another example is how uh, more and more, or rather in the region, we have seen um, uh, fishermen associations working with the government to uh, facilitate the, the delivery of fish from the fishermen to the consumers. And uh, this also creates uh, job opportunities for, uh, by, uh, for those who, who, are, who have lost their jobs and uh, in terms of becoming runners to uh, facilitate this, this transfer of products from the produce uh, fishermen to the consumer. And just a quick video uh, on uh, an example, which is being done in Malaysia, as mentioned by uh, Sujit earlier, uh, the Fishermen's Association working to uh, deliver uh, the products to the consumers. Yeah, and also some of the what you're seeing right now is some of the examples or uh, what or how seafood is being uh, widely sold through Facebook and even on LinkedIn, uh, where uh, traders are posting pictures of their produce, fresh produce, including videos of how the fish is being, uh, what kind of fish, whether it's a, a whole fish or live fish, frozen and even different cuts, whether it's steaks, fillets, and portions. So this is another option, uh, another area where, they, where we are seeing more development as in uh, traditionally Asians eat uh, or rather uh, like to have their fish either full, uh, I mean whole fresh uh, fish, but now we are, uh, the demand for frozen fish, including steaks, cuts, fillets, portion is being um, becoming uh, more um, uh, wide, you, widely demanded. Uh, and that's actually a very significant development uh, because we are looking for more easy to cook kind of products as well. So uh, even in the Pacific region, we are seeing how fishermen are having videos of the fish that is being caught and being offered to consumers to pick up from their uh, respective locations. Uh, seafood widely used in some of the major uh, airlines in the world, particularly um, Taiwan, uh, Thai, Thai Airways, as well as uh, Singapore Airlines. 
which put more emphasis on serving fish to their consumers. We are see, seeing them uh, even offering, opening, opening up their uh, sort of in-flood menus in restaurants uh, in the cities in Thailand as well as in Singapore. So that's a very interesting development because uh, seafood is also being supplied now to this uh, particular um, uh, channels, although uh, there's been sort of less traveling on air travel uh, taking place. Uh, also quickly to mention that uh, WTO uh, recently announced or revised their uh, contraction uh, in the trade, international trade. They had earlier estimated it to be, to, to be between 13 and 32% uh, when the pandemic uh, just happened earlier this year. Uh, their recent estimate is now 9.2%. And this is because there's, uh, with the lifting of lockdowns and uh, from uh, in major uh, producing regions and worldwide, uh, we are seeing some improvement in the trade as well. And you can see from these uh, two tables uh, here, the comparison between January and May and January to July shows that there's an improvement, although negative figures are, we can still see some negative figures. It shows an improvement and recovery in this um, uh, in this uh, region. Uh, sorry, in this region, and uh, one of the reason that one of the things that has been facilitating this is basically technology, on how to get the fish from the producing um, producers, fishermen to the consumers. So again, this is a growing uh, development. It's really growing pretty fast. And, uh, and if you really uh, come to think of it this year, the, the rate at which technology is being used is even faster, I think. Uh, we don't have uh, a specific data yet available on the volume or at least on how much is being sold online or this through these delivery apps and so on. But definitely it's obvious that it's stronger through these channels. Uh, we are looking at food service being digitized and nearly 50% of the world population is now said to be using on social media. So it's a very strong uh, uh, area that can be focused to do this marketing of uh, products. Uh, innovation and technology are definitely crafting and molding this path to recovery. Uh, we call this, we'd like to call this the adaptation phase. And I think it's getting really strong and it's going to characterize the growth in this sector from now on, because uh, to be honest, we really don't know how long this pandemic is going to be. We are far from still um, getting a really uh, good vaccine. Uh, trade is still being uh, restricted and there's still not a full opening of borders yet. So we should be focusing more on how to cater to the consumers who are looking for these products. Uh, they're looking for longer shelf life. They're looking for a variety of products and most importantly, convenience. If I can sell my product uh, to uh, meet the uh, need of the consumer, uh, I'm definitely on the, um, the higher uh, edge. Uh, so just to quickly end, I'll just quote uh, the Lazada CEO, group, uh, CEO uh, Lazada Group CEO who said that COVID-19 is a catalyst of digital transformation in Southeast Asia and e-commerce will be a, become a way of life because when, can you, when consumers build a habit, it doesn't easily go away. Uh, I personally feel that this is uh, really uh, uh, a nail uh, that we should be looking at a point that we should be focusing at to um, even when we are looking at developing our business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Shireen. It is a very, very informative, like um, a lot of information. I'm pretty sure that our attendees like they are very happy. So uh, right now it's come to the Q and A session since we have a bit like over time. So I'll just go through a few question and uh, and if any question hasn't been answered during uh, this webinar. I will also send all those questions back to Ms. Shireen and Mr. Das for, uh, I mean, for answering later on, okay? So here's come to the first question. Ms. Shireen, can you open the camera? Okay. Okay. So uh, for the first question, they said um, aquacultural photo is another innovation that is not mentioned but has a lot of aqua, aquacultural productions 
as well as for electricity generation. So you have any thought on that? Maybe Mr. Das can answer it or? Yeah, I think Sujit. Uh, sorry, I, I cannot. Maybe you could repeat the question. I didn't get it also, sorry. Okay, so aquacultural photovoltaic is another innovation that is not mentioned, but has a lot of aquaculture, aquacultural productions, as well as for electricity generation. So do you have any thought on that? Aquacultural uh, photovoltaic? Okay. Uh, actually, uh, if you consider about the years, uh, there are lots of technologies that cannot be discussed within very short time. For uh, and I, I, I what I can say, I, I can, uh, I can assure that uh, if uh, we have any uh, further uh, discussion in the next, we can also discuss more uh, tech. We, we can come up with more technologies. But I can, uh, I can, uh, I can say that uh, having said that, I can uh, add here that you see, uh, I'm, I'm focusing on the cost-effective and the sustainable technologies because uh, we know these our uh, uh, this part of this world uh, we are very. Uh, um, uh, we need the cost-effective technology and the sustainable technologies. So uh, that's why I will, um, uh, in future, we, if you have uh, time, we will discuss more technologies, which are also um, uh, helping our farmers as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. So um, so for the next question, um, uh, they said uh, disease prevention, vaccine delivery, a major challenge. Uh, could we make any replacements of fish meal in aqua diet? Supply chain management has become main concern during COVID-19. Oh, for vaccination in fish? Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the main challenge in uh, vaccine, fish vaccination is the, um, is the process. Actually, it's very hectic and very lengthy process, and it's very uh, difficult to, to inject each and every fish, you know. Uh, so um, uh, uh, I think uh, that's why the end, uh, the interest of the farmer also is not uh, out, uh, in, in, in ASEAN region and the farmers are also not very much concerned about their, um, about their fish, about their aquatic animal health management. So they are not uh, very much interested on uh, vaccinate the fish. I, I can tell you, I can give you an uh, data that in uh, uh, overall uh, in the uh, globally, one person pharma used in the vaccine and it is already been established for uh, it is already been established for the salmon industry but not uh, in this part of this world yeah okay, yeah. okay. so thank thanks thanks for the two other questions um i think i will go to just only two questions so um they asking that um have you introduced duck weed to control the FCR cost and amplify the profit with high natural protein feed? Yes, very good question and very important one. Uh, yes, duckweed also can also be introduced, uh, can also be used as the alternative protein development, but we have to, uh, in, uh, why we are focusing on the black soldier fly or house cricket or uh, uh, algal, what I can say, the microalgae, marine microalgae, or et cetera, et cetera. But uh, in case of uh, whenever we are, uh, we, we think about uh, the, what we can say, the popularizing the technology among all, uh, among the maximum farmers. So it needs, uh, it needs certain, uh, um, uh, certain uh, amount of uh, time for, um, for, for adopting it and popularizing it. But I think uh, in case of uh, duckweed, I think uh, we need to we need to promote from the uh, from the government uh, fisheries departments, and I think it will be it will also be popular in future. Yeah. Thank you. I see. Okay. So here's come to the last questions. So just just to remind our attendee, if we haven't uh, go through all the questions, don't worry about that. We will uh, pass the, those questions back to Mr. Das and Ms. Shaleen, and they will reply back to you directly. Okay. So for the last question, I, I heard that you mentioned about sustainable uh, aquaculture. So like uh, for sus sustainable aquaculture, how we minimize feed costs using natural feed or homemade feed in fresh water as well as in breakage water tank 
by using new technology? Mm, yes, very interesting and very uh, important question also. But uh, again, I can uh, I can say that um, we cannot assure or uh, any technology cannot assure that it reduce it can reduce the feed cost or it can reduce the operational cost. But uh, obviously, the farmers uh, farmers intention to take the technology and farmers. Uh, the farming practice uh, and their experience can help to reduce the reduce the operational cost. But I, I cannot assure or any scientist cannot assure that any technology can reduce feed cost or operational cost. It, it totally depends on the farmer's experience and their day to day practice of uh, farming system. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. So, so today's thank you, uh, InfoFish and Miss Shireen and Mr. Das for a very, um, like very useful presentation. So I hope that our attendee like, they are very uh, happy. So um, thank you again. And just to uh, remind all the uh, attendees that we will also have another session for Aquaculture Week uh, at 1pm about insect as feed and overview of insect-based nutrition in aquaculture by uh, AFFIA. So please stay tuned with us. And thank you for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. June. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. June. Thank you for having